Good morning. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. My name's Carrie, as many of you know, and they've called me back, great surprise, <laughs> to share stories for kids again since our kids park teachers are taking a break for the summer. So I'm here today with a story for you, and this true story comes from the Bible. You're a little out of practice, so we'll have to work on that. <laughs> yes, this true story comes from the Bible. It happened a long time ago. It happened after Jesus lived and then died and then came back to life. Did you know he came back to life? He did. So before Jesus died, he told all his friends that their job, with help of the Holy Spirit, was to share the good news about Jesus, that Jesus really did come to save us, to rescue us, so that we could be with God forever. And his friends, Peter and John, were doing exactly that when this story happens. So let's get started. What happened was Peter and John were traveling around telling large groups of people all about Jesus. And one day they decided to go to the temple or the church to pray. And when they went up to the temple, there was a gate right before you got in. And at this gate was a man sitting, or maybe laying, who couldn't walk. And we don't know, maybe he couldn't walk his whole entire life, but we know he couldn't walk because people had to carry him there. And he sat at that gate and he asked people who walked by for money. So as Peter and John walked by the gate, the man asked Peter and John for money. And Peter and John said, no, we don't have any money. We have something better than money. And they told the man that by the power of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, that he should get up and walk. And the man believed that, and he got up and walked. That is amazing. Then, because of that, lots of people found out about this miracle and wanted to learn more about Jesus. But some people found out about it and were angry. The leaders of the city did not like this. They heard that what Peter and John were doing and that they were doing it by the power of Jesus or in the name of Jesus. So it made them mad and scared. And they took Peter and John and put Peter and John in jail. Now, do you think that can stop God's message from spreading? No, the Bible says, and I think this is amazing, the Bible says that that night when Peter and John were in jail, 5,000 people heard about it and believed. That is amazing. In the morning, they brought Peter and John to ask them questions. The leaders did. They wanted to know what was really happening. So they said, what power do you think you have that you can heal a man and talk about Jesus coming alive again? Now, what are Peter and John going to do? Are they going to stay quiet? Or are they going to pretend it was nothing, maybe just an accident, so that they don't have to get put in jail? Are they going to be afraid and scared and stay quiet? Will that stop God's message? No. Peter and John, with the power of the Holy Spirit, they shared the truth about who Jesus is, and what Jesus can do, and that Jesus is the one who saves us. And they shared it so perfectly with such wise words because of the power of the Holy Spirit that those leaders couldn't argue with them. They let them go. They let them out of jail because there was nothing they could do. And when they got out of jail, Peter and John went to all their friends and believers, and they prayed together. They thanked God for the way God helped, and they prayed and asked for the Holy Spirit to give them more power and boldness and courage to share about Jesus to everyone everywhere. And you know what the cool thing is? That very same power of the Holy Spirit can be with you and you can share the truth about who Jesus is with your friends and your neighbors. And when you feel scared or nervous, that will not stop God's message because you have that power from the Holy Spirit that you can share boldly and tell the truth about our powerful God. This morning's scripture reading to support, support Carrie's story is Acts chapter 4, and is verses 1 through 31. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. 
They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, and this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you, you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there before them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sahedron, and they conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them back in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, What is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them, because all of the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. On the release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chiefs, priests, and elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do nations rage, rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did, they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, Consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Well, this sermon to support Carrie's story also comes from Acts chapter 4. And uh, before we get into it, I want to acknowledge uh, a, one thing. Actually, last week, uh, if you remember, we had church in the park, which was a great time. And afterwards, we had a cornhole, or if you prefer, a bags tournament. And uh, the winners of that tournament, uh, one is not here. One was Holly Almgeld, and the other was Layla Erickson. They were a team, and, uh, and they were the ones who won the tournament. Now, uh, I don't want to disparage what they did, but I will say that their path to victory included beating small children and grandparents. So I don't know if, uh, I don't know if that makes any difference in, uh, in that, but 
Congratulations anyway, Layla. <laughs> All right, well, throughout the book of Luke and now throughout the book of Acts, one of the things that we're seeing is that we, as the people of God, are called to be witnesses. We're called to be witnesses to Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. We're called to be witnesses to the healing and salvation that can be ours through Jesus Christ. And, and, but not only did he tell us that we needed to be witnesses, but he told us how to be witnesses. And not only did he tell us how to be witnesses, he told us about the power that we have in order to be witnesses in both deeds through acts of mercy and also with our words. But too often, we give in to the temptation to believe that faith is a personal or private thing. And that's really what our, our faith becomes. So we become satisfied doing our religious practices and hanging out with other Christians and not doing a whole lot when it comes to being witnesses to Jesus. And sometimes even when we want to be witnesses... We're not very effective at it. We're very timid with it. And so even when we do our acts of mercy, we don't follow them up with words about Jesus. Or sometimes we get sidetracked and we rely on other sources of power like our education or our resources or our institutions or even political power and we forget about the real power that God has given us through the Holy Spirit. And so I want to start with a question that I want you to ponder throughout the message today, and it's this. What is the source of your power? Now, I ask that question because as we turn to this story in Acts chapter 4, and if you're not already there, I'd love for you to turn there. We're going to walk through the story, and uh, so I want you to follow along in there with me. Uh, but this story picks up right where we left off last week from Acts chapter 3. Uh, Peter and John were walking into the temple when a beggar who had been lame from birth asked them for money. And Peter and John looked at, him, looked at him and said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. Rise and walk. And the man immediately got up and walked for the very first time in his life. And when he did, he followed Peter and John into the temple also for the very first time in his life. And, of course, this created quite a, spur, a stir, but it also created an opportunity for a sermon. And, uh, and so Peter took the opportunity, filled with the Holy Spirit, and he started to preach. We did this in the name of Jesus, whom you crucified. And that's where we pick up the story today with Acts chapter 4, verse 1. This is what Luke writes. He says, The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. Now, this is what Luke is doing. He's introducing all of the players in the scene. And, and he talks about, of course, Peter and John, but then he talks about three other characters or actually groups of characters. The first characters were the priests. Uh, the priests were responsible for carrying out the sacrifices and doing the religious duties of the temple on behalf of the, the people. They had the authority of the, uh, of the religious establishment, and, and all of this was grounded in the Torah. Uh, in other words, they had institutional power. The second characters that we see are the, is the captain of the temple guard. Now, this was the man who was in charge of keeping peace in the temple. Uh, Jerusalem had always been kind of a powder keg in the Roman Empire. Uh, it was ready to explode with any small incident to set off riots among the Jewish people. And if there's anything that the Roman Empire couldn't tolerate and certainly could not afford, it was riots. And so the Jerusalem leadership knew that if there was any kind of unrest in Jerusalem, that the Roman Empire would come down hard. And so they wanted to avoid that at all costs. The captain of the temple guard had political power. The third group that Luke mentions is the Sadducees. Now the Sadducees are a little bit different than the other two groups for a couple of reasons. First, unlike the other Jews, the Sadducees actually didn't believe in the resurrection. Not just Jesus' resurrection, but any resurrection at all. And that was a point of contest between them and Jesus many times. But they were also different because... They actually didn't have any kind of political or religious authority. They were actually a small group of self-appointed religious leaders who came to prominence sim simply because they were part of the rich upper echelons of society. And so you might say that they had financial power. And so we have three groups 
with differing kinds of power, religious power, or institutional power, political power, and financial power, who came to question Peter and John. And in verse 2, it says they were greatly disturbed. Actually, uh, maybe a more literal translation would be greatly annoyed at what was happening. And they were actually annoyed for a couple of reasons. One, was because it was the apostles who were teaching people, right? Uh, Which they were concerned about because that was their job. They were the ones who were supposed to be teaching in the temple. And so now these people come in, they're not authorized to do it, and they start teaching things. And the second thing that it was a reason it was annoying because they were teaching things that they didn't agree with. Um, So for instance, the, the Sadducees were incredibly concerned because they were teaching about the resurrection of the dead And everyone else was concerned because they were teaching about the resurrection of the dead that was in Jesus' name. And they came over to confront them, but Luke says that since it was already late, this didn't last very long. They just seized them and put them in jail overnight until the Sanhedrin could meet in the next uh, next morning. Well, the Sanhedrin was a group of people, uh, of 70 people, who was used to great, uh, uh, great power and influence. And so the question that they ask Peter and John in verse 7 when they start to convene is really interesting because they say this, by what power or in what name did you do this? Now, when I first read this, I I thought that maybe they were trying to determine whether the miracle was done in God's name or in the name of some other spiritual being, some demonic source. You know, the guy was healed and he was standing right in front of them and so they couldn't deny the miracle, but they did believe that there were other powers who could do similar things. And so that's what I thought they were getting at initially, but actually that's not really what they're asking. See, they were bothered because Peter and John were teaching in the temple without permission. What authority, who gave you the authority to teach in our temple is essentially the question. Who told you you could do this? Now, I don't know if you remember this or not, but back in Luke chapter 20, a very similar thing happened to Jesus. This is what Luke writes here. One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple courts and proclaiming the good news, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, together with the elders, came up to him. Tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? Sound familiar? They said, who gave you this authority? In other words, we didn't authorize this teaching. Well, of course, Jesus, as he often does, he answers with a question. John's baptism, was it from heaven or was it from human origin? And what happened was, was this put the religious leaders in a bit of a bind because Jesus was gaining popularity and, you know, it was growing, the crowds were growing. and, uh, And so then they start to deliberate amongst themselves. They say, if we say from heaven, he will ask, well, why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, all the people will stone us because they are persuaded that John was a prophet. Now, this question, or what this shows, is that there's a question about where real authority comes from, right? They were afraid of the people because they were actually more interested in staying in power than they were in the truth. And if that's the case, who's really in charge? Well, this is the same struggle that was happening with Peter and John. But Peter, rather than asking a question to them, he actually gets kind of snarky with them. Okay, look at how he answers in verse 8. Now, keep in mind that this, uh, this trial was starting to gather a crowd. These were public, uh, public hearings that were happening. Okay, verse 8, here's what Peter says. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed. All right, now let me paraphrase this just in case you didn't get it. Right, so they ask, whose authority did you do this on? And Peter says, oh, are you talking about the miraculous healing we just did? Are you talking about the mercy that we just showed to this guy who hasn't been able to speak or been able to walk his entire life? Is that what you're talking about? Right? So, he, so he's, uh, he's, he's kind of upping, <laughs> upping the pressure here a little bit. Okay? The, the implication is something like, all right, smarty pants, tell us about the miracles you've done. I've got receipts, so let's see what you've got, right? And then he goes on, 
And he says this in verse 10. He said, if, if that's what you're talking about, then know this. You and all the people, everybody else standing here, not just the Sanhedrin, but all of you who are watching, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. And he goes on to quote from Psalm 118. And he actually personalizes it. Psalm 118 uh, uh, says, the stone the builders rejected, but, but Peter looks at them and he says, the stone you builders rejected has become the cornerstone. For salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given by, to mankind by which we must be saved. Peter pulls no punches, does he? It's pretty amazing, especially because this is the same guy that only a couple of months ago, when Jesus was standing trial, denied he knew Jesus because he was afraid of a little slave girl. So what's the difference? Same guy, two months, maybe. But now, under the threat of arrest, he stands up and boldly proclaims the name of Jesus. In fact, this uh, wasn't lost on the ruling council either. Look at verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. Here are a couple of blue-collar workers with Galilean accents, that's, you know, backwoods, hicks, speaking clearly and boldly. How can this be? Well, they didn't realize it, but the key to the whole passage comes up next, right here, the second part of of uh, verse 13. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Think about that. You see that? And for them, it's not just an interesting coincidence. It turns out that this is the very reason for the amazing change that happened. But they missed the connection, and so they have to ask this question, by whose name or whose authority did you do this? See, the council had a type of authority, a kind of authority. They had institutional authority, and that's not illegitimate, right? We we give authority to institutions, and they can do good things. There can be some real authority there. Some had political authority, which also can be legitimate. There's political authority that's actually given by God, and so it's not illegitimate. Some of them were in position simply because they were wealthy. That's less legitimate. Uh, But religion, politics, institution, money, That was the source of their power and authority. And Peter and John didn't have any of that. We know they didn't have financial power because they just said to the the, uh, lame man, we don't have any money, right? They didn't have any of that power. But they had power from the Holy Spirit that came from being with Jesus. Okay, now you tell me, who has the real power? came quite obvious, I think, as we go on in verse 14. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men? They asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they've performed a notable sign and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. All right, now, do you see what's happening? What, what's happening is, is the authorities are being exposed for what they are, okay? They have no real power in this situation. And, and when people have only the illusion of power, what they do is they try to tighten their grip from, to keep from losing control. But what that does is it only starts to expose the fact that they lack true power. And this is what was happening here. Verse 18. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help but speak about what we have seen and heard. In other words, we have been so captured. We have found Jesus so compelling that we cannot help but speak about what we have seen and heard. You see, the effectiveness of of Peter and John wasn't because of any official position. They didn't have one. 
didn't come from their education because they didn't have that either. They didn't have wealth, any kind of status. And so what was the source of their power? These men had been with Jesus. And what was the result of that power? Look back at verse 4. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Think about that for a minute. Pretty exciting, at least for Peter and John, not so much for the Sanhedrin. So the Sanhedrin did what they could. They threatened them and they released them. And when they did, Peter and John immediately went back to the other believers, back to the church community. And what did they do? They hired lawyers to bring religious liberty claim against the Sanhedrin, didn't they? Oh, wait. They didn't do that. Well, what did they do? They went back and they prayed. Now, hopefully this is something that most of us would do too. We would go back and we would pray. The question is, what did they pray? Well, let's go to verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and do what? Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. All right, do you see what's happening there? They're not praying that Jesus or that God would remove the threat. They didn't ask for protection. They didn't ask for more resources. They didn't ask for worldly power or authority. They asked for two things. God, give us the strength to speak with more boldness and do more miraculous things, okay? Give us boldness and show up. That's all they asked for, right? And what happened? He did. In fact, the story of Christianity from the book of Acts on is the story of incredible growth, exponential growth through the work of God and the courage of Christians who really did believe that there is no other name under heaven by which you must be saved. And the church grew and grew and grew for the next 300 years with almost zero power in society. Oh wait, except for the power of the Holy Spirit. Do we see that today in our society? We see it in other parts of the world, Africa, South America, even, even the East. We see it all over the place. Lots of places where Christianity doesn't have a lot of power. Do we see that in the church here? Do we see that in our church? I'm so thankful for the lives that are, are being transformed here. It's life-giving for me, but to be honest, it doesn't happen enough here in our local church certainly, but I would say that that's true in the Western church in general. So the question is, is why are we not more effective? Why are we not effective witnesses the way Peter and John were? I thought of maybe a few possibilities. One could be that maybe we're just not that into Jesus. I hate to say it, but I think this is true for a lot of us. We're more into our jobs or or houses, or sports, or politics. You know, many people say that politics is the new religion today. Spend a lot of time entertaining ourselves. And because of that, the creator and savior of the universe, the source of life itself, gets pushed out to the side and only to be brought back out on Sunday mornings. So we go about our religious business, but many of us have lost that sense of purpose. And the truth is, if we're, not, if we're just not that into Jesus, then there's not going to be any urgency to tell people about him. So that could be one reason. Another reason is that even when we do stay on mission, we oftentimes put our faith in the wrong kind of power. We've done this for years. Sometimes we've done it by watering down the message of Jesus, accommodating to the world. We think, well, if, if everybody thinks we're just like them, then they'll be interested. Or sometimes we've sought political power in order to advance the gospel, to legislate people into following Jesus. Or we've put our faith in cultural relevance and expensive marketing campaigns. Or we've tried to build bigger and more efficient institutions with business principles, more resources, and higher production value. Individual believers don't have much to do out there. Just invite them to church and we'll do the rest. Now, not necessarily totally against the last two. 
I think there's some room for, for some of these things. But I think we've made the mistake of thinking that it was our resources or our creativity or our business savvy that will lead people to Jesus. And so we rely on the wrong kind of power. Or it could be that we just think that we're powerless. We look at the world around us, we see church attendance declining and faith becoming less prominent in our society as a whole, and we feel helpless. Methods that used to work no longer do, and so we buy into the idea that religion is on the wane and no one is interested in it anymore. And there's nothing we can do about it. And so some Christians give in to despair and opt instead for a personal faith that doesn't make any difference in the world. And that sense of powerlessness is why so many give in to fear. Because when we do face opposition or rejection, we give up and we settle for safety and comfort. I've been in a lot of small groups and in a lot of worship services and a lot of prayer meetings, and if I had a dollar for every time we prayed for safety and protection, I would be a rich man. Of course, that wasn't in the believer's prayer, was it? Well, there are many reasons why we might not be effective witnesses. But I just want to tell you today that it doesn't have to be that way. This week I attended a funeral of this man. I've got a picture of him up on the screen. His name is Terrell Walter. Some of you know him. Uh, may, maybe some of you didn't hear that he passed away uh, last week, I think. I'm not sure if you've ever been to a funeral like this, but this was one that was at the same time inspirational and incredibly convicting at the same time. Terrell was born in 1966, and he spent the first part of his life living on the south side of Chicago. And actually, this picture doesn't do him justice. Uh, he said when he was in prison, he could bench press uh, 450 pounds. So when I first met him, I mean, he wasn't tall, but he was a big dude, right? Uh, this was later in his life as cancer had ravaged his body. But as he got older on the south side of Chicago, he joined a gang, climbed the ranks. In time, he was caught selling drugs and sentenced to 10 years in the Illinois State Penitentiary. And after serving his time there, he called a friend and he said, if I go back to my old neighborhood, I'm going to go back to my old ways and so I need somewhere else to go. Well, his friend knew about a program called Pure Life Builders uh, up here in North Minneapolis, a discipleship program for men who were just like him. And he had no other choice but to go. And during his time at Pure Life Builders, Jesus got a hold of this man's life. And if you know him, you know what I'm talking about. Terrell became the director of a couple of food ministries, one in St. Paul, one in North Minneapolis, and eventually he became the pastor of Beacon of Hope Church in North Minneapolis. And if you ever came into contact with Terrell, you instantly knew two things about him. First, Terrell loved people. He loved all people. You know, rich, poor, black, white, doesn't matter. He loved people. And he especially loved Jesus. Like you couldn't have a two-minute conversation with Terrell without hearing the name of Jesus come off his lips. He was, he was that into Jesus. This man was all about Jesus from the time he woke up to the time he went to bed. And by the time cancer had ravaged his body in the last few weeks, he was able to say without hesitation, I have no fear. He was not afraid. I would guess that there were probably 300 to 400 people. I don't know, is that a good estimate of the funeral? Three or 400 people there? And you look around the room and you saw black and white, rich and poor. I mean, this man brought people together. There were people in that room that would never be in any other room together. And they were all there because of Pastor Terrell. And many of them came to Jesus because of Pastor Terrell. It is no easy feat to bring together a group of people like that whose lives were touched so deeply by one man. The question is, by what power did he do this? It wasn't through his education. It wasn't because he was wealthy or in a high position of power. There was only one power that brought that room together like that. It was the power of Jesus. 
His life was a consistent testimony to the power of Jesus to get a hold of even the worst offender and turn his life around. And that's still the core of the good news, isn't it? That's the core. That's, that's it. Okay? God's ability to transform even the toughest cases. And everything that Terrell did was through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I left that funeral asking the question, I wonder what people will say about me at my funeral. If I'm honest, I'm pretty sure it won't be that. People will probably say I was a nice guy, hopefully a good guy. You guys can nod your heads if you want, right? <laughs> or, or, you know, just no, and then we can talk afterwards, right? They'll probably say I was a faithful husband and father and grandfather, and I was into sports, and I love to make pizza. I'm sure that'll probably come up. Hopefully you'll say I was a pretty good pastor. But person after person at Terrell's funeral said pretty much the same thing. Jesus. He was all about Jesus. Now why was he? Well, it's because Jesus saved his life. He, he like literally saved Terrell's life. His power didn't come from anything that was impressive or put together or anything like that about himself. He just had such a deep sense of his own imperfections, but an incredible sense of God's gratitude for saving him. God's mercy that, that he could not help but speak about what he had seen and heard. That was the power. So, follower of Jesus, what will people say about you? Will they say that you are all about Jesus? Is Jesus so compelling to you that you cannot help but speak about what you have seen and heard? Have you been so amazed by God's work in your life that even when you face opposition that you will boldly proclaim the name of Jesus? Well, if you're like me, and I would guess maybe most people in here are like me, you would say, I don't think that's probably true right now, but I want it to be. So, how do we do that? Well, it doesn't come from more education. It doesn't come from wealth or status or leadership books. It starts by being with Jesus. Right? When you look in the face of Jesus, then you get to see yourself for who you really are. And even better, you get to see Jesus for who he really is. You get to come face to face with your own inadequacies but also face to face with the grace that, that God gives you that says it doesn't matter because God has mercy for all of us. When we spend time with Jesus, we learn to be sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit guides us day to day, not just to sit at home and wait for the second coming, but to represent Christ in the world and to speak boldly about what you have seen and heard. The second thing that we need to do is we need to remember that we are witnesses. A lot of Christians like to be with Jesus because it feels good. And I will admit, it does feel good, and that's great. But don't forget that we all have a calling, okay, to be witnesses in the world. Both of those things are, are necessary, both word and deed. And if we learn nothing else from the book of Luke, it's that Jesus calls us to lead with acts of mercy toward people because it reflects the character of God. But our acts of mercy don't stand on their own. They bear witness to the goodness of God in our lives. So we have to be willing to connect those actions with words. Third, pray for boldness more than you pray for safety. Too often we focus on safety, don't we? And, and safety is okay. But there's actually a difference between praying for safety because we want to be comfortable and praying for safety as we go out into the world that is not always going to agree with us, that is not always going to love us or respect us. They might argue with us or think that we're crazy. You're probably not going to be thrown into prison or killed anytime soon. Now, boldness, you have to remember, is not the same thing as obnoxiousness. Okay? Terrell was not obnoxious. He was infectious. He had a godly optimism because he knew the power of Jesus to transform a life. He knew it because he experienced it. So how about you? 
Fourth, listen to the Holy Spirit daily, not just here in the sanctuary, but as you go out, you have to recognize that the Holy Spirit is with you. The Holy Spirit does not stay in this sanctuary, but goes with you daily. So be attentive. Recognize that as a believer, the Spirit of God is available to you day to day so that you can be active in the lives of people around you. Carry on this relational conversation. God, what are you doing around me? How can I be a part of it? Finally, exercise courage. I hate to break it to you, but there's no substitute for it. I know a lot of times we, we, often, we often want to uh, have this surefire technique or method of evangelism that will take away all of our fear and everything will work just perfectly. And I'm just going to tell you, it doesn't exist. There are certainly some things that we can do that are helpful, but there is no substitute for exercising courage. But the great thing about it is, is that the more you exercise it, the easier it becomes. You'll never know the power of God until you're willing to exercise courage. So the question is, do you believe that life with Jesus is better? Do you believe that there is no other, other name under heaven by which men must be saved? Do you believe that the Holy Spirit is still active today? Then how are you tapping into that power? Lord, we thank you for today. Thank you for your word that challenges us and convicts us. I thank you for people like Terrell that are doubly uh, inspiring and convicting all at the same time. But God, as I think about what they said about Terrell, I so want that to be true about me. And so God, would you help me to remember how you got a hold of me and you've been transforming me and you continue to change me in all of my flaws and imperfections. You continue to refine me and make me into someone who is capable more and more of loving you, being all about Jesus. Pray that your Holy Spirit would work powerfully among your church, not just here, but as we go out into the world as witnesses, that we would remember that the Holy Spirit goes with us wherever we go and that we'd be willing to tap into the power of the Spirit. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.